Hey guys, before we start, a quick shout out to Alpha Dog Nutrition for sponsoring this podcast. Alpha Dog products are now available at dusupply.com and you can use code ALPHADOG15 at checkout for 15% off and a credit for free shipping to try it yourself. Now let's get you to your podcast. Welcome to my podcast, where we're going to talk about a lifestyle with dogs and threw in a few life lessons along the way. Whether you're a hound hunter, bird dog enthusiast, running setters, pointers, retrievers, or a flat out running dog junkie, this podcast is for you. I am your host, Heath Hyatt, a certified law enforcement canine trainer with over three decades of personal and professional training and handling experience. It's time for me to pay it forward. So grab your leads, lace up those boots, come and join me on this lifelong process of teaching, training, and learning. Are you looking to unlock your dog's full potential and give them the best nutrition possible for peak performance? Then look no further. A Nookshook has what you're looking for. A Nookshook's nutrient-dense formulas are crafted to keep your dog's energy high and performance top-notch. Packed with premium proteins and essential fats, a Nookshook delivers the balanced nutrition your dog needs to thrive. From hunting dogs to police canines, a Nookshook is trusted by professionals. Give your dog the power of peak performance with a Nookshook professional dog food. So, I have to give a shout out to my buddy Clinton for hooking me up with this um, guest because he actually contacted me and said, hey, I think this would be a really good guest for you if you're interested. And once he told me what it, who it was and what they did, I was like, absolutely. And here's why I'm excited about, about this one is because you guys know, you've heard me talk about my daughter with me all the time how she hunts with me. She comes with me. She was in Canada with me. You see my reels where she's helping me with the dogs. Um, A lot of times she's taking the videos uh, for me when we're working with, when I'm doing it with the dogs. So, you know, and I just had this conversation with our guest and I won't give it away yet, but in the last 30 years, that's how long I started in 94. 30 years ago, you didn't see very many females in this industry, you know, and over time, especially in the last 10 years, like it has skyrocketed. Like you, you see females with their own dogs, their own packs. You know, I was in Canada with Sarah and she was talking with, um, you know, Chelsea Hansler and they're doing like a, a women's getaway. Like it is, it is becoming a, the norm in this industry. And it is a great thing to see all walks of life taking part in and enjoy something that everyone listening to this podcast feels so strongly about. And that is hounds and hound hunting. So our guest today is straight out of Botswana and they run, she and her husband run a safari and it's called nail safari. You can go online and look at it. Uh, it's got, they got some great pictures. I'm telling you, some of these pictures, that, that Cape Buffalo picture just kind of stands out at you. But I've got Inga Smith Nail on, and we are going to talk dogs. We're going to talk safaris. We're going to talk hunts. We've got a whole, whole lineup today. So thank you guys for being with us. And Inga, thank you. And if you don't mind, just kind of give us a little background on you for the listeners. Um, who you are, what you do, how long you've been doing it. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, so basically, I grew up in Botswana, born and bred here. Uh, my dad was a professional hunter, so I followed in his footsteps. Um, I was, for a really long time, was the only professional female Bots- uh, professional hunter in Botswana. So I'm not the only one anymore, thank goodness <laughs> for that. <laughs> So um, the hounds, basically Botswana closed, as most of you know, in 2014, uh, banned hunting and um, opened up again in 2019. And then our wonderful COVID hit. 
so um yeah we we took a few years break and for a tourism industry it was hard but uh, got back to it and um that's basically when we started the the leopard with the hounds and all those things which is a really good thing for us <laughs> because we really love what you do um so yeah we um that's basically it that's that's what i can say so you you've been hunt, like since you were a child you hunted with your dad or you you tagged along or you actually helped him until you become an adult yes yes mm-hmm. basically that's that's it but it wasn't with leopard or hounds it was just general hunting it was mm-hmm. just uh, yeah so and we before we restarted recording i want to go back so you said in 2014 it got shut down was that hound hunting alone or was that all all types of hunting it was all types of hunting. Uh, we had planes game hunts, so the, the private farms could still carry on with their hunting, uh, basically in Palo, Kudu, those things. But um, your the big game, the elephants, buffalo, leopard uh, line has always been closed. But all those um, closed up and there was no more big game hunting or in communal areas or any quota given out. What was the rationale behind that? Was that like scientific driven or was it just... Um, politically driven it, I would say it was politically politically driven definitely um, they you know how the greenies are they can always put scientific stuff uh, <laughs> against it but uh, I think it was mostly politically driven because when we changed presidents that's when hunting reopened and um, the communities were given back their rights to sell the the quotas And um, it's been a great benefit for them. I mean, there's a lot of wildlife animal conflict, wildlife human conflict out there. And um, actually now it's, the animals are worth something. So there's a saying in Africa, if it pays, it stays. That's just exactly how it is. So for the five years, so from 14 to 19, with no hunting allowed except on the private ranches, how did that affect the population in the areas that were not hunted? Well, did you see a growth? Did you see a, a downtick of it? Um, did you see more diseases? Was there anything like that that was observed during that time period? I would say the elephants, there was definitely a huge growth in that. I mean, Botswana is the, the country with the most, the highest elephant population in Africa. So in elephants, there was definitely a growth. Um, but in the predators, I would say, I, I can't say like 100% sure, but if I had to look at if a, a leopard kills a cow, it's a dead leopard, basically. Um, there's there's no worth to it. I mean, the cows, to them, is worth more than a leopard's life or a lion's life. So now with now that they can sell their quota and actually get some money and do improvements on their areas, they're actually looking after the animals now. So when a leopard or a lion catches a cow, it's not anymore just a dead leopard or a dead lion. It's now... We'll have to look after it because someone is going to pay us for this for the tag. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I, I mean that that that's like here we get um, we get a lot of crop damage um, from from bear, and they do um, they just do kill permits so the hunt, the farmers can go in and do them. So same purpose except behind yours, you're actually somebody's able to you know profit and and make a living from doing that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I like that idea. Of course, we don't we don't sell hunts like we we don't have we don't do that here. But I completely get it. So I want elephants. I thought that elephants were on the endangered species list. Is that am I missing that? That's so not true. Um, they are on the endangered species list. They are, and mm-hmm. I don't really understand why because there's thousands of them everywhere, and they just just destructing this whole company, this whole country. Mm-hmm. This whole uh, like, if you go up north in Botswana, you'll see it, how the vegetation, how they've destroyed the vegetation. It's crazy, and but people think they're extinct, and it's, it's not. It's not true at all. Well, when I seen some pictures on your website, I'm I'm like, okay, where am I missing this? So, if they're on the endangered species list, how how are you able to hunt those? So you get CITES tags. Um, Botswana gives out a certain amount of CITES tags every year for elephant and leopard. And that's basically how you you obtain and you can hunt hunt them. So is there a quota? Like if 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 in like in Botswana, is there okay, you can kill ten and once ten's killed, that's it? Is that how, is that what you're saying? 
Yes, so they give out a quota each year, and then each area has its specific number of animals it can it can hunt. So they'll give out a quota, say, 10 elephants, uh, 2 leopard, uh, 10 gamsbuck, 10 impala, 10 wildebeest, and that's the quota for the area, for the community, and that community can sell it to, to a safari operator in Botswana to hunt those animals. How far do you have to travel to hunt? Like once, let's say the area you live in, that quota is met pretty quickly. Do you travel outside into different units to do that? Yes. So we buy a few areas all over Botswana um, for the leopard and the elephant. So um, I would say the furthest we have to travel is about 500 miles from home um, to to hunt. So we, we try and buy close to home, but as soon as we've bought what we can and of course, there's competition between other outfitters and stuff. So then you you go out a little bit further and start looking for areas a bit bit further away from home. So I, I'm assuming that's a pack trip. If you're going 500 miles, you're staying for a while. Yes, and unfortunately, most places are camping. So you have to yeah. pack up the trailer, the tents, the food, the everything because it's so remote, and you have to take everything with you, including water. So it's quite <laughs> it's quite a trip. Yeah, I didn't think about that, but yeah. So is that um, it? Says here your hunts are ten days. So is that a is that a ten day trip for you guys? Y'all go and stay for ten days and then come back home. So we try book trips. Um, say we ha- bought an area five hundred miles from home. We try book everybody back to back. So we just do airport trips, pick up clients, drop off clients, head back to camp, put our camp once, and then it's all in all over. Otherwise, you you'll finish all your profit with fuel. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that. All right. So tell us a little bit about your your outfitting business. Tell us, you know, tell the listeners, you know, a little bit about what you do. I know, you know, we know we're going to talk about the leopards in a minute, but you've got a long list of animals on here and a lot of stuff that's going on. So here's your minute to, to do that. So um, my husband loves the Eastern Cape. He's from the Eastern Cape. So um, he tries and sells hunts down there, planes game hunts um, down in the Eastern Cape. So he, he makes time for that, 100%. He loves the mountains, so he makes time for that. And then uh, we have the elephant and we have the leopard. Our leopard is what my main focus is on, basically. Um, I love hunting the cats. That's what I love to do. And then he does most of the planes game and the elephant hunts. So... That's, yeah, we have the Plains game in Botswana, and then we hunt the Eastern Cape as well, and then your big game. So are y'all doing separate hunts at the same time, or are you always together if he likes to do the, the other things? We try and do things together, uh, but not, not it doesn't always work out that way. And um, But most of the hunts we try to be together and um, do it together. But, yeah, sometimes it just happens to be that he's on his own and I'm on my own. Yeah, like I said, I'm just kind of cruising through these pictures. All right, so what – I'm looking at your, your leopard hunt. So what drew – you said that, that cats are what you like to hunt. What drew you to that? What What is it that you was like, all right, this is what I'm going to chase? Well, ever since I was a little girl, I was fascinated about leopards. Leopards are – I mean, they're elusive animals. They don't want to be seen. They're shy. They, they try and keep out of human way and – they're just really fascinating animals. The way they go about everything in their daily lives is just really fascinating to me. So when um, the thing was introduced to me in, 20, the hound hunting was introduced to me in 2021, I just couldn't help myself. I was I was completely fascinated. I mean, where, where these hounds take you on leopard tracks is like in the daily life of a leopard. Basically, you're walking in his tracks as his, the daily life of what he sees every day. And that just absolutely fascinated me. Where was your first hound? Like what, you know, you told me that you had just got into it. So where was you able to actually get to see that first? So we bought an area in 2021, which is a really difficult area. It's a communal area. Um, so they do poison the cats there. And um, so you have really smart cats um, in that area. And um we had we had hired another pack of hounds in by that time because we didn't have our own hounds, and um, the 
that cat, we hunted him 12 days straight. So he was so clever that he would get into the, to the crawl where the cattle were and he would drink between all those cattle, he would drink water and then leave the crawl and head for the mountain. So he had, he knew the ins and outs of everything, that cat. We hunted him for 12 days straight and getting up at two o'clock in the morning, trying to find tracks and then not finding tracks and then finding tracks. And then the hounds, it, it was such a cold track that the hounds were really struggling and there was no vegetation to keep scent. So it was a really hard hunt, extremely memorable hunt. Um, and on day 12, we, we eventually caught up to this cat and he had gotten into a cave. And um, the client was not with us. He was um, hunting elephants. And we had to wait two hours for him to arrive, of which this cat's sitting in the cave and the dogs are tired. It's hot. And um, eventually the clients arrived. And uh, we gave the dogs water and just give, like, gave them a bit of motivation. And um, they pushed the cat out. And he stood on the horizon on this little hill. And uh, the client managed to take him. And it was just, it was perfect. It was just the perfect scenario. And these were your dogs? No, no, these were not my dogs. Those were the dogs we had hired in um, oh, to do the hunt. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I heard you say that. So you had hired somebody to come in and help with, help you take the cat for the client. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We didn't have hounds by that time. We were just introduced to it because we knew we wouldn't be able to get this cat on bait. He just it wouldn't eat meat because he would poison so many times. So he wouldn't put you would only eat what he kept, what he killed. That's crazy. And how did he how did he get into the middle of the cattle without spooking them? I, I don't know, hey. I really don't know. But we found his tracks every single day in the cattle crawl, between all the cattle, and he would drink water there. <laughs> I have no idea. And he, so he was going, was he going from the water straight back to the to the den? Yeah, every 100%. Day? He was, every day. But uh, by that time, we didn't know that because we couldn't follow his tracks because it was really hard tracking. So by day 12, we had figured out, okay, he's going back to that mountain. We need to get the hounds to that mountain and we'll eventually catch up to him. And, and you, so basically you shortcut it. You didn't go back to the water. You knew he was going there and you tried to cut the track going back into the mountain. Yeah. So we went to the water. We found his track there and um, there was a road about two miles from the mountain and we saw his track crossing that road. So what happens in these communal areas, the cattle walk over all these roads. So you lose the track, you don't know where the track is. You can't really follow it with your, your eye. You need the hounds to follow the scent. And um, on that day, we the cattle hadn't walked that road yet. So when we drove that road, we found his tracks on that road. And that just gave us a little bit of advantage to, to cut that distance because he walked quite a big distance to water um, to actually catch up to him that day. So how far from the road where you caught him was he? Wow, it was a probably a good eight miles that he wow. that he went into that that mountain range. Um, so they the hounds definitely did their work. They 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 did really well. And, and do you? I'm sure you do. What type of hounds were they? Was it was it a mixture or was it certain hounds or? It was a mixture. It's, it's it was a mixture of everything. It was blue ticks. Um, there were foxhounds in there. It was a it was a mixture of a red ticks. It was a mixture of everything. Right. Well, and after that, you just decided we've got to do this. Yes. After that, I was like hooked. I I had to do this, and I decided no, we need to start our own pack of hounds and and do this ourselves. No more hiring in people. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell me about that venture. How did you go about establishing your own pack? It was definitely a hard, a hard road. It still is a, a learning curve, hundred um, percent. So it was really hard because nobody would would like to help you, unfortunately, because you're taking away business from them. So they nobody wanted to help you. It was it was hard. So basically, I just started looking for young dogs, and um, I managed to get two young dogs from Zimbabwe. Those were the two walkers, and. Um, they didn't know anything. I think they, they had two or three cats experience, but they didn't know anything. And I said, I remember saying to my husband, I don't know how I'm going to teach these dogs how to take leopard scent, but I'm going to try <laughs> definitely. And um, then I got a few hounds from South Africa, also young dogs. My pack consists of young dogs. I, I had to teach them what they know myself. Um, 
I, I lie. I got one older dog. Um, she's nine years old, and um, she was a, a hound from a leopard pack, but she's too slow, too old, too yeah. So she, I, I owe it all to her. She, uh, she taught my young dogs what they know today. <laughs> so yeah, that's basically how it. What kind of dog is she? She's a red tick. Red tick. She's a red tick pound, Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, and just so the listeners know, um, Inga, go ahead and tell them tell them what your pack is, so they know what kind of dogs we're talking about, because you got a little bit of a mixture. Yes, I do have a little bit of a mixture. I have a bit of uh, Gascon crosses, um, blue ticks, I have walkers, plots, plot hounds, um, red ticks, and yeah, that's a, and then there's a few crosses between. I would say red tick, bloodhound. A little bit of everything in there. I don't think there's one dog that's pure there, to be honest. I think they're all a bit of everything. And as far as we know, none of them, they probably come from the States, but you didn't get any of them from the States. Everything's come from your region. Yes, everything's come from around around Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa, all just come all over the, all over the Southern Africa. Yeah. All right, let's go back to the training. So, you were trying to train these young dogs and you did what I recommend to people all the time. Buy an older dog. It don't matter how old it is. It doesn't matter how fast it is. If it can trail and take a track, you can put a young dog or two with them and teach them. Yes. Is, 100%. is that exactly what you did or did you do some tweaking in there with some other things? No, that's exactly what I did. I, I used that dog to teach the young dogs. That's absolutely, she. I owe it all to her. If I didn't have that dog, I don't think I would be as far as running our own pack of hounds this season. I, I don't think they would have caught any leopard without her. <laughs> so was she there when they caught their first one? She was there, yes. She was there when they caught their first one. And um, from there, it's just been they they really understanding now what's happening, what they're supposed to go after. All right. Well, that, I'm going to come back to that. I want to come back to your first actual catch with your pack. But let's talk about the the young dog. So you bought an, you bought an old English dog. How how long did it take to? Because you're four seasons in now. How long did it take for you to start actually being successful? And I don't mean consistent because, you know, when you're starting to be consistent, you've got it licked. What, yes. what, how long was it? How long did it take you before these pups, you know, were that you were able to catch catch your own game by, with just you and those pack, that pack? A lot of hunts, eh? A, a lot of hunts, a lot of cats. Um, so I can't remember how many, but it took me a good year to mm. actually get, get them going and that's me getting up every morning almost at four o'clock trying to go find leopard tracks even just if we not catch the cats but just trying to get them to smell the scent and understand that this is what we're going after yeah and that that's without hunters because if you took hunters you're you're kind of like shooting in the dark right yeah it's kind of getting a bad name for yourself <laughs> yeah but uh that's that's without hunters that's just with just taking the dogs out and putting them on their track, just having them smell that. Yeah, a year. All right, now tell me about your first catch. Who was there? Where was it? Tell me, tell me the story. I want to hear the story. I want to hear the story. Yes. Okay, so basically in the Kalahari, um, it was the first hunt, proper hunt with the dogs, um, with a client. There was a client there as well, but he's a really good friend of ours, so he understood where we're coming from. And um, he understood the pack of hounds that they very new into this and all those things. So um, we got a track really early in the morning, put the dogs down and um, they started taking it really slowly. And um, I think by 11, we had started moving this cat, but I, I had four dogs on the ground and um, I started putting in new dogs and the, the cat started to loop. And of course, the dogs don't have the experience of looping cats and all that stuff. So that was a bit of a bugger up. We had dogs going everywhere. We had cat, uh, the cat running between us. And <laughs> it was a bit of a shit show, to be honest. But eventually, the young dogs got it straightened up. By that time, the old uh, 
uh, red tech, she was tired by then. She was on the back of the car. She was finished. So it was me and the young dogs trying to figure out this track. And um, eventually they got it straightened out. We caught the cat on the ground mm. and he didn't want to climb a tree. So it was a big hair raising ground fight. And because they're young dogs, they all thinking that they can catch it. And I think half of the pack got hurt that day. But uh, nevertheless, the, the client shot his cat and it was definitely a very memorable day. <laughs> we were all very happy. All right. So go back and tell me what looping, uh, because sometimes our language is different. We use different terminology. Explain what looping is. So basically the cat runs over his tracks or he backs tracks on his tracks to try and lose the dogs. So the dogs didn't have that experience of they were backtracking this track and taking it completely back to where we were going, where we were coming from, but the cat didn't go there. He was just going halfway down his tracks and then making big circles and then small circles and all sorts of things. So they, there was a dog barking on the other side of the circle and there was a dog howling on that side of the circle and it was just, and we, we, don't, we didn't know which dog was correct and we were all just running around between these dogs trying to figure out where the, where the track is going and eventually it straightened out and... Um, Actually, two of the young dogs were correct, and they all managed to straighten out the cat and eventually catch up to him. So the, you didn't have to straighten. They ended up straightening it out on their own. They ended up straightening it out on their own, yeah. They ended up managing to, to find where he had actually gone. After it was like two hours of just complete chaos. Well, I mean, it's good, though, that they, you know, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, but it's good that they were able to, to do that without her. Yes. Like, I, I talk about self-discovery all the time. When a dog can figure things out on his own without our interference, then that learning lesson is pretty much done. So yes. after, after that lesson that they taught their self, they figured it out on their own. Did you have to help them anymore? Or did you just sit back on the next time a, a cat looped and they're like, okay, I got this. Boom, boom, boom. And they're out of it. Yes, the next time a cat looped on them, they knew exactly what was happening. They they knew what to do. It was not it was it was more organized than what it was the first time, definitely. Yeah, I, I tell people all the time when I'm teaching, um, and I think after your episode, I don't know. There's going to be an episode either before or after yours about I'm going to talk a little bit about slick tring and um, three three things that happen, but. If a dog can self-discover, and I tell my handlers this all the time, it doesn't matter if it takes five minutes to figure it out or 10 minutes, or if I'm bear hunting and it takes 30 minutes, you waited two hours for that to figure itself out. But then after yes. you, after you, the dogs did it, they're like, I got it. This is, I figured it out. I'm, I'm on to the next one. And the next time was a short order. Yes, hundred percent. It's it's crazy when they learn this themselves something, when they figure it out themselves. They just catch on to it so so much quicker. Then I I take when when we were just taking them out with, with the dog's name is Juliet, the red tick. Mm -hmm. And um, when we were just taking them out with Juliet, they would depend on her and not try and do it themselves as much. But when as soon as she fell out of the mix, they realized like, gosh, we need to do this ourselves or we're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> we're not going to have fur in our mouth anytime soon. We're going to be running around. And uh, no, it definitely taught them a lot. Definitely taught them a lot. Taught me a lot as well. <laughs> it taught you patience. Like, yes. Really, like, yes. you know, it's so hard for us to sit back when we know the dogs are in an active mistake or in an active yes. hard spot. And I get on my handlers all the time in the, in the, the law enforcement world. Do not assist that dog. The more you assist them, the more they rely on you and they shouldn't be relying on you. We're using the dog no. because of his sending the capabilities, like stop. And it's so hard yeah. to sit back and say, all right, I'm going to sit here and twiddle my thumbs until you figure this out. And people have such a hard time doing that. Yes, that is very true. That is very true. All right. So how many dogs are you running at a time? Uh, currently 12. 12 dogs at a time. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. So, and we're going to talk about your pack, but you said that you only had those two down. So while they're trailing, is this a couple dogs or do you allow them all to go at, at one time? 
So basically, we put down four dogs at a t- four dogs in the start just to see how the track is. Is it cold? Is it how how they react to it? Um, mm-hmm. If they take off on the track and we know it's it's quite a warm track, we'll put in all the dogs and they'll all go together. But um, when it's a really cold track, we'll keep those four dogs until it warms up a little bit and then start putting in more hot nose dogs um, into the ch- into the chase. And then basically by the end of it, they'll all be on the ground. And what are, what are you what is the four that you're using to start with? Uh, so there's two blue ticks, there's a Gascon cross, and then there's a Bloodhound cross as well. She's a black and tan Bloodhound cross. And are do you at any point? I know this is kind of like an interview because I'm like asking tons of questions. Do you at any point put a young dog in with them? so that young dog can learn or do you hold them until you get it worked up? No, I'll definitely put in a young dog in there. They each make turns. So um, some of last year's pups that I bought from somebody, um, uh, there's two two of them. So they make turns and um, one of them, either one of them goes to gets to go down first with those dogs just to get that scenting, learn to take that scent when it's a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. All right, so what are the so you're saying that they're a little bit colder nose than the other ones, and you start adding in the hotter nose dogs as it picks up. Yes. So t- tell me the difference in those two style of dogs. And I understand we all understand what cold and hot means. Like a cold a cold nosed dog can take the track that is difficult and has more patience to work connect the dots on that track than the hotter the hotter nose either doesn't have the patience to do it or they like the hotter scent. So we've got that covered. But what is the difference that you see? Well, basically, um, that is a, it's a hard question to answer. Um, So basically your, your, the colder nosed dogs, they they do have the patience to take the track and they, they stick on it. So they don't just, yeah, run around like crazy things and looking for the track. So I would say that the hotter nosed dogs definitely want the fur in their mouth. They def- they want to catch it. They they want to be there and catch it. Where I would say my colder nose dogs do want to catch it in the end, but they not as much as the the hotter nose dogs. They I would say two of the the colder nose dogs also don't like baying up the cats. They are they come back. They they don't want to be there in the bubble of the cats. Where the hotter nose dogs they want to be there. They want to bay it up, put it in the tree, and or fight it on the ground or whatever the situation, put it in a hole or whatever the situation may be. So that, I mean, that's, and I heard, I heard another podcast here, this actually this week talking about a female that they would turn loose. And if the bear was baited up, you know, she, she pretty much wouldn't want anything to do with it. So how do you keep, how do those dogs, continue to want to trail such a sophisticated track that is hard that you've got to figure out at what point is it that they're like, okay, I'm done with this. You guys do the rest. So basically when they make first contact with the cat, um, then that those dogs are like, no, I'm out of here. When the cat growls for the first time, they'll come back to me and they'll walk with me. Um, they don't, they don't want to have any, anything to do with the baying of the cat, but they would like very much like to chase it. Um, but not stand there and fight it. So if the cat doesn't stop and bay, if it just runs in trees, do they go on? Yes. Then they'll go on and tree the cat. They'll stand under the tree and, and mm-hmm. stand there with other dogs. But anything, if it, so most of the cats, the leopard especially, I would say 95% of them don't tree in Botswana. Well, I was going to ask. Big yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big fight. It's not, they, they don't tree. They know dogs. They know people. They know they've been chased by cattle herders. So they don't want anything to do with a tree. So all, do all four of those dogs come back or you just have one or two? Two. Two of them come back and yeah. they, they walk with me. The other two will carry on and, and bay up the cat. So is that the Bloodhound Cross and the Gaskin Cross? Yes, the two blue ticks come back. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you how those crosses uh, and the, the Gaskin, I, you know, I can see a little bit more of a difference, but the, the bloodhound, and I've seen several bloodhound crosses through my career of hunting here. Do, will, will that dog tree at all? No, no, they're not really good treeing dogs at all. Um, but she, she will be there. She will be there, but she'll be fooling around there somewhere. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to baying up the cat, she, she, she'll bay it up. She's not, they're not scared dogs. Definitely not. Um, the blue ticks are a bit more, they keeping their distance from the cat. They don't want to be in the cat's bubble. And it, that's not the Gaskin cross blue ticks. No, no. The Gaskin cross blue tick is there in the cat's face. She's and quite, the, she's quite a big dog. And you don't know what the blue tick bloodline is at all. I have no idea. Hey, I, like I said, yeah. I just fish dogs from all over Southern Africa, whatever I liked or whatever people were willing to sell to me. And, um, I just made it work. Right. Well, I mean, it seems like you're doing really well. All right. So that's four dogs. Tell us about the other dog. And now that you're telling me this, I kind of understand why you're using, you like, you know, more, you know, more hounds. Um, yes. So tell us, and I know that you said you had two plots. Let's talk about those. Um, tell me about those, how they operate and what it is that you like about them, what they add to your pack. Okay, so I, I really like the plot hounds um, more so than any of the others. I, I really like the plot hounds. Um, so I would say the plots are very hot-nosed. Um, you can make them colder. Um, I am actually trying to get one of the plots to go down first with the, with the rest of the cold-nosed dogs. And um, he's actually, he's, he's picking it up. He is definitely picking it up. But um, I found the plots are really good at baying. Um, really good at chasing the cat. They can loop the cat with it 100%. And um, they're really good bay dogs. So he, even if he gets beaten by the leopard and gets really hurt, he will stay there until you shot that cat or until you pull him off the cat and say, it's not, that's not the correct cat. We're going home or whatever the situation may be. Where other dogs, I found that if the cat beats them really hardly, and like bites them or slaps them or whatever they do come back if they get hurt badly um they do come back to you they will not stay there but the plots just they, they just stay there and um bay up the cats and even with a the chase they are hot and nose so for now they are i put them down um once the the track is a bit hotter and they definitely run in front they are they are the lead hot the uh, hot nose dogs 100 percent so um, I've just found them to be, they want it more than what the other hounds do. Mm -hmm. And how do you, I mean, I mean, we've talked about how, you know, how rough the cats are. Like, how do you, how often are they hurt and out of commission? Like, do they get, do they get that tore up or they, are they getting, are they getting well educated where like, they take some calculated risks, but they're not getting pommeled every time you take them. Yes, yes, 100%. But the cats are rough on the dogs, especially on ground fights. Um, in the tree, not not at all. It's it's uh, Most dogs come out and then they'll be absolutely fine from the tree. But when it's a ground fight, I would say at least two, three dogs get hurt quite badly, um, either bitten or slapped, and then they're out for two or three hunts. Mm-hmm. Well, and I guess, you know, going back to the treeing, it really don't matter if you're, if you're catching 95% of your game on the ground, you know, treeing is irrelevant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. no, the, especially, especially the Kalari cats, the, that's where we do most of our hunting is in the Kalari. Those cats don't tree. They, there is, sometimes there isn't even a tree to get into because there's just little shrubs, but, mm -hmm. um, 95% just, they'll run past the tree and just go sit in a thick bush. And what is an average, what is an average race? So here, um, you know, of course my bear hunting is a little different, you know, a, our bear may run 20 miles if, if they choose, like, you know, we may, we may pop one right up after a mile or so and, 
we've had races that cover two or three mountain ranges and they never stop. So what's an average, once you get that cat up and moving, do they catch pretty quick or you got to stay after them for a while? No, they ca they catch it pretty quickly. Um, I would say within three miles they have the cat. Uh, mm -hmm. Once it's up, once it's up, it's it's a quick chase, and um, then the cat's up. They the the leopard aren't built for they don't they don't have endurance. They can't run forever. They get tired, and then they just want to lay up and fight. So um, it's not a very long chase, but uh, they do walk quite a big distance. So it's sometimes it's a long time behind the dogs cold trailing it and sometimes it's fast like you said sometimes it's two three miles and they have the cat mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your environment like when you talk about cold trailing like tell me how your environment lays and what is considered an old track for you guys Okay, so it, it varies. Hey, um, in the Thule, the, the hounds seem to do better on cold tracks. Um, there's a lot of bush around us, so a lot of grass, a lot, a lot of things for scent to stick to. So I would say anything from eight to ten hours would be considered a cold track um, in, in the Thule block. Then uh, definitely Kalahari, I would say it's hard because the scenting conditions is really hard there. If you don't find a track early in the morning, it's it's hard. It's hard on the dogs. It's warm there. It's warmer than what it is here back home where we stay. Um, there's no – the scenting conditions is really bad. So there I would say five, five to six hours is going to consider a cold track. And what was the other one? Chili Block. No, like how old was – in the area you're in? So five hours in the Kalahari and what so, was the other one? by us about eight to ten hours eight to ten hours and when you say that it's tough tough trailing is it i don't know is, do you guys have humidity like we do or is it dry air it's dry it's really yeah. dry so the kalahari is really 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 dry there's no water it's desert basically it's mm -hmm. desert um and the sand is really thick so once it w starts to warm up, that sand becomes extremely hot, and the, the dogs struggle. They they pause, burn, and it just it, they struggle. Mm -hmm. And I heard you earlier in our conversation. You was talking about you know there was no vegetation to catch the odor, um, yes. which you know most hound hunters understand that that you know scent can travel a long way, and it needs something to collect on. And yes. when you have surface like what you're having, it can get in the granules, it can get in the dirt but it makes it so hard to pull it up out of it. Yes. No, it does. It definitely does. Um, I would definitely say that the, the Kalari is a bit, it's a bit harder on the hounds when you want to cold trail it than the Thule. The Thule block is, is a bit easier. It, there's a lot of um, vegetation for the scent to stick on, so it makes it a bit easier for the dogs. Mm -hmm. And when you say, how do, how do you guys know that it's an eight hour? Do you have cameras? Do you, do you drag roads or do you have somebody that said, Oh, I seen a cat cross the road last night at 10 o'clock. How do you, how do you guys kind of gauge that? So we drag, do drag roads. Um, in, in the Tule, we do drag roads, even in the Kalari to see fresh tracks. I mean, there's a lot of night critters going on and about and all those things. And you want to make sure that you have a fresh track, not a track from two days ago. So we do drag roads every day um, to make sure that the track that's crossed is a fresh track. So then you can get you can't really gauge it from there. You just have to put dogs down and try and see if they can smell it. Mm -hmm. And you that's when you just put your four down and if they can yes. if they can work it, then they go on. Yes. So your Gaskin cross dog, what is that? So I know that we talked about Kareken and how they, they went to the petite Gaskin. So yeah. are you using the grand or the petite? It's the grand. She's the okay. grand. Yeah. I actually bought two dogs from Karika um, recently in the beginning of the year, um, mm -hmm. but they have two petites, both petite um, blue ticks. So I'm very excited to see what they're going to do. They both just turned a year old. So mm -hmm. very excited to see what they're going to do. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would assume with that breeding program and what she's continued to do, 
I, I would really think that you should have some nice hounds coming forward. Yes. No, I'm very, very excited for them. Very excited. They both show huge potential. So I'm very excited to see what they're going to what's going to what they're going to become in the next few years. Well, that brings me to another question because we get into this debate here about, you know, hunting young dogs. If if a cat is that um rough when do you start hunting those young dogs have you had those dogs out or you wait until they mature a little bit i start hunting dogs on a year and a half so some dogs a bit later it it depends on the dog's personality but most most dogs is on a year and a half they we put them into the pack and they have to start hunting and most do really well um when they see their buddies all there and all fired up they they want to be like that and they also want to bay up the cat, and so most is a year and a half. Do you do anything with them? I mean, I'm sure they're running loose and whatever, but do you do anything like to prep them for that, or you just kind of let them be dogs until it's time to take them hunting? What's, what is you guys, how do y'all handle that? So I do a lot of drag with young dogs. Um, mm-hmm. I get some scent and then put down the scent so that they at least know how to use their noses. A little bit and um that's just how i prep them as i do a lot of drags with them so then they can know to follow the pack and know a little bit about what they're looking for not just going blindly into it um i try and keep the, the leopard skins that we shoot so sometimes when we close to home we shoot a, a, a skin i'll show them the skin and they can smell it and all those things but sometimes when you cover hori by the time we get home the skin is already in the salt so, but I try and expose them to as much as I can. Um, if we hunt a cat close to home, I'll come and get all the pups and take them to the cat so that they can see it. And um, yeah, that's basically, and then they'll just have to go into the deep end and try and swim. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm a big proponent. I know some people think I'm crazy, but I I, I try not to take my young dogs out until they're a little, they're a year older, a little older um, because you know, the first bear you turn them on and it, it turns and it wants to fight and it's a rough bear, then, you know, you make or break them. And you know, a lot of people's theory is either they have or they don't. Yeah, absolutely. The genetics are there or they're not. But I also know that the mentality of that year old dog is like uh, an eight year old kid. And you're not going to put an eight year old kid in the boxing ring with Muhammad Ali. You're just not going to do it. So, why should I ask my, my up to do that? So I really like the thought that you're waiting a year and a half, especially for for an animal that's that, you know, a rough on, you know, to hunt. Yes. No, 100%. It, I'm, I've seen, like, if you take them too early, you break them. Then they, they get scared of the cats. And I, I do think that those two blue ticks that do come back to the cat, they are the prime example of dogs that were hunted too early on leopard. and now they just don't want to bay it. They they scared of it. They do want to hunt it, but they don't. They don't want to stay. They stick around for the for the ground fight. Yeah, probably had a bad experience when they were younger, and yes. they're like, you know, yeah, my my natural instincts is to track and trail, so I'm going to do that. But when the fight comes on, you know, it's like smashing your hand in the car door. You do that when you're, you know, five years old. The rest of your life, you don't smash your hand in the car door. <laughs> yeah no yeah so so that's interesting i mean that's and you're you said that your plot dogs are your lead your lead dogs so you told me that you were running some walkers and some running dogs and mixed in there and they, they yeah there is some, go ahead they, there is some walkers in the pack um i think i've gone through three or four walkers right now there's two um in the pack I okay, so I ran forward a stage and I actually gave two to people in the Eastern Cape as a for caracal dog because they are petrified of the cats. They don't want to bay up the cat. And um I know for a fact those dogs weren't introduced to, to leopard early in their life. So um they just didn't want anything to do with them. So I sent them down for um, caracal, to, to hunt caracal, because it's a smaller animal, which is not aggressive. So the two that are in the pack right now are, are pretty good nose dogs. Um, I wouldn't say that they would uh, bay up the cat as the plots do, 
but um, very good nose dogs. They, they they definitely have the nose to back them. But when it comes to getting there, they they're not as as hard as the plots are. Well, I, I know that you know talk, talking with um, Clinton that you know it, it takes it takes a special hound to do what you're doing. Like you know, it's a different it's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole different animal. And I mean, over the years. I mean, I can tell you that I've had dogs exactly what you're saying that, you know, I could run and treat coons with them all night long. And the first bear I put them on, they was like, mm -mm, I don't want to eat don't. Any of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. you know, just, yeah. just the game that you're, that you're pursuing alone takes a special, a special dog to be able to handle that type of madness. Yes. hundred percent. I agree. Hundred percent. You need a very, very special dog. Yeah, and like I said, I, I mean, I'd want my trail dogs to stay, but I also understand the. I, I understand that. I mean, I get it. I mean, I, I can't tell you the times that I've bought an older dog to help me along with my pups, get my pups running, and yeah. you know, I mean, as far as the training part of it. So yeah, I get it. No, hundred percent. Right. I'm also I prefer those two trail dogs coming back because I don't want them to get hurt. I I need them on the hunts, so I do prefer that they they don't stick around when when, when the cat's up, that they do come back and and be safe. Well, I mean that and that's why you're hunting a pack. You've got certain dogs that are doing performing certain parts of that hunt. Hundred percent. They all yeah. they all have their job. They all know what they're supposed to do. They all do things differently, and that's just what makes it work. Yeah. So, you know, tell me before we round this out. Tell me about tell me about one of your most memorable hunts that you've had. Okay, so I must say one of my most memorable hunts. We um we hunted a cat here close to home, and um. We really, really struggled with the cat. He was walking quite early in, in the night, so that by the time we had gotten the track, it was already past twelve hours old. So we were, we were quite struggling. We were the the dogs were struggling. We were all struggling, and um, I think it was by day four, we were all quite frustrated. And um, we managed to get this this cat to track early in the morning, and we put down the dogs. And um, I. On that hunt, I can't remember what happened, but I'd only had two of the really cold nosed dogs there. So I'd put in some of the hotter nosed dogs, um, which was a foxhound and one of the plots. And they started trailing this cat really nicely. And we put in two two more dogs. I think we had six dogs on the ground by that time. And the cat, so it was along a river, a, a river frontage. So um, really, really thick bush, really thick bush. So we were crawling through this bush behind these hounds and um all of a sudden i heard all the hounds turning around and they were running straight towards me and i was like whoa what's happening and i have a guy that walks with me um his name is pete and pete and i dive behind in behind a bush and this cat comes running past us and um with the dogs on his tail and he gets into a hole a warthog hole so now we, both Pete and I are standing there like, what the hell are we going to do now? We, we, how are we going to get this cat to come out? So all the hounds have gone into the hole um, behind the cat and you can hear it growling in there and you can hear dogs barking and it's just chaos. And we're both standing outside the hole like, what are we going to do? How are we going to get it out? We, we have no idea how we're going to get it out. And um, eventually he's like, well, he's going to go back and call the other guys. Um, and ask them to come in and help us because we, we don't really know. We don't know if we're going to close the hole and then dig him out or what are we going to do? And I'm like, yeah, no, no worries. You go. I'm going to stay here with the dogs. But now I'm standing behind the tree um, because I can hear the cat inside the hole, but he's quite far in the hole. And um, he takes a really long time and the cat goes quiet. And I thought to myself, maybe he's gone out on the other side, but the dogs are still in the hole. and. Um, I walk closer to the hole, but now I'm quite cautious. I'm going closer, but also hiding behind some brush there. And all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. One of the dogs must have bitten him or something, but he came out there with speed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was about 10 yards from the hole. 
and um, luckily he didn't see me, but uh, I, I just lay flat on the ground and all the dogs passed me with a cat. And uh, they put him, up, put him up again on a big ground fight. But it's so thick there that you, you, see, you can't even see the dogs. I'm standing 10 yards from the dogs, but I can't see the cats or any of the dogs. So that was quite hair raising to eventually get in there and shoot the cat because it's just, it was like five yards from him. So you said the cat didn't see you. So if he would have seen you, is it typical that they would have just come after you instead? Yes, he would have mauled me 100%. Now, do you carry a weapon? Yes, yes, I carry a shotgun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no. 100%. If they see human, it's it's game over. They will maul you, 100%. And, I mean, they'll just bust through the dogs and do that. Like, the dogs, like, for us, if, I mean, if, if a bear sees you most of the time, he's going to go the other way, most. And like I said, there's always an anomaly. We can, you know, say what ifs. But most of the time they go the other way. It's it's You're saying it's the exact opposite. If they see you, nothing else matters. They're going to come at you. Yes. Yes, that's basically how these... Remember, these cats have been hunted by by local village dogs, by her, cattle herders have been chasing them. So they know people, they know dogs. They know when there's dogs, there must be people close by. So they basically just looking out to see maybe they see a person some way and they will come 100%. That's crazy. And I mean, I heard somebody else say that too, that you had to be very cautious and... I don't know. Maybe it, um, maybe it was Steve Biggerstaff telling me that, you know, you have to like you have to stay downwind of them and like be very yes. cautious about how you work around them because, you know, what the way they react to humans. Yes, hundred percent. They aren't they aren't very friendly. They are very pissed off when you when the dogs have caught them. They are very angry and they're looking for something to take it out on. <laughs> Yeah, no, not, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I want to come over and witness that or not. That's that's pretty tough. Yeah, no, the cats are, they're quite crazy, I must say. Well, I guess that's what makes it exciting, right? Yes, that is exactly what makes it. It's just an adrenaline-filled hunt. It's just the sounds that come from the cats when the hounds make first contact with him. The It just, it just is, it's an adrenaline filled hunt. You, you are, you pumped with adrenaline from the get go to the end of it. Now, do you have trouble with your dogs getting off on the other game? Because I mean, you're, you've got all kinds of animals there. Do you, is that something you have trouble with or do the dogs pretty much stick to what they're, when they make the loses and the loops and stuff like that? Yeah, so the hounds are game proof. They will not chase anything else except a leopard. Um, they are very much game proof. And do you guys use Garmin's, or do you, I mean, do you have a tracking yeah. system? Or, yeah. Yeah, I use Garmin. All the dogs have collars on them, and then I use a Garmin handle. Gotcha. Yeah, that was that was because I know that some some people in that region or in that area do not. And I'm like, how do you keep up with them? Like, mm, I don't know about that. No, I don't know. That must be really hard. That must be really, yeah. really hard because sometimes you just can't keep up to them. You just you hear them in the distance sometimes, and then sometimes you just completely lose them. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. What's so what's the longest hard. race you've had? What's the longest, um, like daylight till dark? Stayed after them like mileage. What's your longest hunt? So we've picked up a, a cat track at say seven o'clock in the morning. Um, so we we have a limit time, so we're only allowed to hunt six to six, six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. Um, so we picked the cat up the track about seven and we hunted him until five o'clock. So the hounds made first contact at five o'clock, so they trailed the whole day behind him. And um, we made first contact five o'clock and they bade him up around half past five. So we had half an hour to shoot him. So that was quite a nail by to see if we're going to be able to to get in there. And it was a big ground fight again. So it was luckily we managed before <laughs> before six o'clock to to get him. 
how how far did they trail if they trailed from seven to five? If I remember correctly, I think it was something like eighteen miles. It was Ooh. it was quite the distance for for the dogs to go. That's crazy, and I mean, I know our guys out west that that hunt, you know, mountain lion. You know, they have some of those that they trail all day and then go back tomorrow and put on and you know continue on. I mean, we just we're not able to trail that way. Um, we used to. I don't know if the dogs or the bear population. That's a whole nother podcast. But we used to trail for good parts of the day, but now we don't really do it anymore. Yeah, I must say that was the exception. exception. It hasn't happened like that again. Um, it was only that one time that it went really, really far. That cat walked. I don't know where he was going to, but he was on his way somewhere. Yeah. You think he was run- just like our juvenile bear, our juvenile boars, they're the ones that do that. They cover the most ground. They'll, they're looking for a home range, so they'll just keep walking until they find somewhere. This was actually a really old Tom, and I, I think I said this to, to my husband as well, I because we speak about this hunt a lot, because we just, it, this was the exception. I mean, it hasn't happened again. And it was a really old Tom. I think there was a younger male that came into his area and pushed him out, and he was on his way looking for somewhere else he could set up camp. And um, because he walked a lot of straight lines, um, it wasn't like he was walking and hunting. It was a, like he was going somewhere. He was on his way straight to somewhere he knew was an area he could he could say was his own. Well, yeah, and I was just looking at a picture here. Um, how many how many cats are in a like? How many? If you have a unit. I don't know how big your units are, but like how many big toms like that will you find in a, in an area? So that would all depend on the area. Um, the Kalari, I would say, is definitely more dispersed. Um, there's not a lot of big cats in one area. Um, I would say in about – so all the units are different sizes as well. Um, some of them are small. Some of them are big. Um, but I would definitely say that you would have about a 30 by 30 mile radius that you'll find one cat in one big big male a 30 but so that's pretty i mean that's a i mean that's a big that's a big block yes yes that's that would say the kalari areas the tuli block areas they're more densely populated there's a lot of food there's a lot of water so they can live in close proximities with each other and um where the kalahari they have to go far for water food is scarce it's hard. It's hard desert country. Yeah, and I'm I'm just sitting here looking at some of your pictures. That big male, the 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 white dog. I'm assuming it's got Gaskin in it. Um, looks like an older dog, older male. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's looked like he's been battle tested. Yes, he he was always in the. He's passed away now, unfortunately. He was an older dog, but um. He he was always in the mix. He always got beaten somehow. I don't know how he always managed, but he never learned that it has sharp ends. He just always be, be in the the war zone. And you you're holding a little like a lemon spotted lemon dog, like a uh, she's got a petite head on her. Yes, a she's a fox hound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, I see that. And then there's a what's the tat what's the what's the freeze brand on the Walker dog? Um that is actually that red tick. That's the red tick? If I remember the picture. It is yes, a that's Juliet. Yeah. That yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. she's got the so there's a guy in Botswana that um he he had really, really good dogs. His name was Trevor Fulmer. He passed away unfortunately. And he bred her and that's his tattoo that's on her ear. Mm-hmm. I see that. Very nice. Well, there's, I mean, they're good looking dogs. I mean, I, like I said, it looks mm-hmm. like the area you're in is just a lot of, got a lot of scrub brush and dry ground. <laughs> yes. That's hundred percent how it is. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. All right. Inga, you, for, must you must definitely come out next year. We would love to have you. I'm telling you, I, I want to, I want to just tag along and watch and learn and just soak in all the dog work. Cause it looks like 
you know, um, amazing to me. No, you should definitely. You're really more than welcome. Well, I'm probably going to take you up on it. So, percent. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> yeah. All right. So to finish this out, is there anything you want to leave us with? Um, you know, you've been you've been dog hunting for four years. It looks like you know, looking at your website, you guys look like you're doing very well, very successful. Anything you want to tell the listeners? So if I could go back to the woman hound hunting, um, it's definitely a new thing. It's definitely the the last part of the last few years that women have come into it. And um, I just want to say, like, I'm proud to be in, in the hound hunting, especially leopard. I mean, leopard are quite dangerous animals to be in it. And um, to everybody out there that especially woman wise if you were looking at starting your own pack or whatever and something was keeping you back just do it you can do it and you if you put your mind to it anything is possible so i just want to say that but if you're a woman and you want to hunt a pack of hounds of your own just do it you'll manage that's right well it looks like you you're doing fantastic you you bought an older dog you made a good decision and got the rest of your dogs started in the right direction so you know kudos to you guys and i can't tell you enough you know i appreciate i know you guys are busy hunting i did not realize that i appreciate you taking time out of your day out of your weekend to sit down and talk to me and anything i can ever do for you guys over here all you gotta do is let me know thank you so much i do appreciate that no thank you for the opportunity it's been a, a really great uh podcast talking to you and um yeah I hope we can do it again. Do you like to be outdoors like I do? If so, unlock the wilderness with Onyx Maps. It is your ultimate guide to exploring, hunting, and conquering the great outdoors. With detailed maps, real-time tracking, and exclusive access to public and private lands, Onyx Maps is your key to adventure. Discover the possibilities and never get lost again with OnX. So subscribe today using the promo code K920. Letter K, number 920. And know where you stand.